I apologize that I have to leave for a flight as soon as I'm done at four, but I can do this in seven minutes, right? <laughs> My disclosures don't relate to this talk. So uh, I thought I'd put a little bit in here about principles, because I think when you're approaching reoperative Crohn's disease, the principles are perhaps more important than the approach, actually. Uh, so remembering when we're talking about inflammatory bowel disease, we're doing this for patients who've generally failed medical management and we're trying to control their symptoms. We're not curing the disease like ulcerative colitis. These are people who will have ongoing and often further recurrent disease because they're already here for recurrence. And our goals are to do that while trying to pervert, preserve continence, pervert, preserve small bowel length, and avoid an ostomy if and when possible, although that's not always possible. And it's really a great area for multidisciplinary collaboration. If we do it properly, you can return patients to a normal quality of life quite early, uh, within 30 days, in fact. They can be close to normal, and this is from old work that we did. Many of these were reoperative patients. It's important to set up the operation well by understanding the patient well enough before surgery. So trying to find out what was done in prior operations is useful. Uh, understanding the anatomy of any anastomosis and understanding the bowel length that may be present because this allows you to modify, it doesn't change your operation because you're going to end up mobilizing it and defining what's there, but it allows you to change your discussion that you'll have with the patient about management of postoperative expectations. Endoscopic evaluation. Uh, you need an endoscopy at least within two years. Generally, that's not a problem. They'll come from an outside gastroenterologist, and they've probably been having endoscopies too, recent, too frequently, if not, uh, not frequently enough. But, um, but it is important to find a relatively recent endoscopy, so if you're doing a small bowel resection, to make sure that the colon is normal um, and not find out afterwards that they also have a segmental area of colitis, patchy colitis, that you may have wanted to address uh, with this. And that also allows you to determine a plug-in site for your anastomosis. Uh, so thinking particularly of people with colitis as well as small bowel disease, um, that you need to know that the rectus sigmoid is going to be normal again to allow you plan your operation and plan whether you're going to need an ostomy. And so sometimes we'll do uh, re-imaging or image these people before surgery, which you wouldn't necessarily always have to do otherwise, but the re-op patients are different. This is just a fun slide to show you what imaging not to get. Patients sent in recently who had a capsule study uh, they didn't find the capsule, they weren't sure what was going on, so they did another investigation, so they did another capsule study. And actually there's a great photograph which I should have put with this, but it's a picture of a capsule from a capsule. So. Preparing the patient, so I mentioned the selected information to define the anatomy, to correct the correctable deficiencies, whether they're metabolic or particularly nutritional, uh, to mark for an ostomy, to withdraw immunosuppression when you can, particularly thinking biologics. Obviously, you can't often taper these patients off all of their medicines. We give a mechanical and oral prep when we can. Uh, obviously, the evidence around that is the best for management of wound complications. Uh, and people who have a chronic partial obstruction will just give them magnesium citrate and a couple of days clear liquids, but we'll still give the oral antibiotics. IV antibiotics, stress steroids, DVT, the normal stuff. Stents I use very rarely. Um, and selectively, we published a randomized control trial on it about 12 years ago, uh, showing that if you need them and put them in in the operating room, it's just as easy for urology. Uh, and so that's what we do. We'll do them usually selectively. And only for selected reoperative pelvic cases, not routinely. An abscess or phlegm that's going up the gutter or retroperitoneum, uh, so s particularly a reoperative psoas abscess, something like that, they'd be the kind of patients that I would think about it in. General principles, remembering surgery is not curative. Midline extraction, understanding the, the hernia-related downsides of that, but generally you're trying to preserve stomacytes, particularly in these reoperative patients. Preserving small intestine length is key. If people have very short intestine, if they have non-obstructing disease, which is chronic and stable, and a, uh, you know, a single stricture or a couple of strictures, you may not take out all of their disease. Obviously, that's not generally what you do, but in people with short bowel, multiple reoperations, it's a consideration. Generally addressing all strictures, however, though. Uh, steroids don't mandate a stoma, and then almost never putting drains in. Fistulas to the bladder, or a large residual septic cavity, which you can't completely excise. So what are the true limits of reoperation then? 
Uh, so adhesions, you know, if you have somebody like this with essentially no peritoneal cavity and established fistulas, it's not going to be somebody who'll approach laparoscopically. Obesity, less of a challenge in these IBD patients. They've usually been sick enough that they've lost weight. Not always, but uh, usually lost weight, and the steroids aren't enough to keep them up. Mesenteric friability, you heard a nice talk from uh, Sang Lee, but again, generally not an issue. It's, it's rare enough that you run into this problem. A thicker mesentery can be a problem, and there's different ways to handle that, as we heard earlier. The density of the inflammation can be a problem. Sometimes people with a very chronic abscess or fistula, the inflammation is literally stony hard, and it's simply hard to chip through with laparoscopic instruments. And then the size of the phlegmon. If somebody has a 15, 18 centimeter phlegmon, there's not a whole lot of point in doing it laparoscopically if you're going to take um, an incision 20 centimeters long to get it out. And so obviously none of these are absolute criteria for not being suitable for laparoscopy. Um, they're all relative. And then some fistulas. But as I'll show you in a moment, many fistulas are approachable laparoscopically. The general principle, though, is that if you don't look laparoscopically, you won't know, and you're often pleasantly surprised. These are old data from about 15 years ago that we published, uh, just showing many of the benefits, and about a third of the patients in this series uh, 15 years ago were reoperative cases and all of the traditional benefits that you expect with minimally invasive surgery. And you can see that the length of stay over open was dropped uh, by about 60%. Um, in this population, and that has not changed. This is more recent data from Sharon Stein and uh, myself when I was at Case, about 90 patients over a couple of years, uh, two-thirds suitable for laparoscopy, generally the small bowel population of this. Um, more than half were reoperative cases, uh, and for the laparoscopic patients, there was a 4% conversion rate and a decent length of stay. And there are meta-analytic data, obviously poor studies in that they're non-randomized, non-level one that are being meta-analyzed, but nevertheless giving us a reasonable number of patients to look at, uh, and you can see the reasonable conversion rate for the pathology. Um, the most likely pathologies to lead to conversion, no shock, like we just talked about, mass, difficulty in dissection for that more dense inflammation uh, and recurrent disease. Uh, and laparoscopy, while it was associated with longer surgery, had all of the other consequent benefits for the patients, again, as expected. So what specifically about approaches then? Uh, so obviously just carefully taking down adhesions that are present uh, to get to the phlegmon and deal with the phlegmon, the adhesions from the prior surgery. Uh, generally going for a subumbilical port and a couple of uh, ports opposite the pathology being taken out. Um, but sometimes in these patients, because of the prior surgery, you'll have to start with a port off the midline uh, and often put in a second port off the midline and try and take down the adhesions that are on the midline to allow access uh, to do the rest of the operation. So this is a population where I'll consider using an optical port, 5 millimeter optical port in a left lower quadrant uh, or upper quadrant. Um, trying to keep the ports lateral to the rectus and obviously getting a hand's breadth apart. And this is just a flag one coming down with obviously an abscess and fistula through the abdominal wall. Crohn's colitis, just to deal with it briefly, because really for the recurrent Crohn's, it's uh, more usually a small bowel. Obviously, you can do any type of colectomy that you need to. Uh, we do sometimes do a total uh, colectomy with a partial rectal resection and do an ileal pouch rectal anastomosis uh, to preserve continence in these patients. Uh, and if you do it in a very selected population, it works well, and obviously you can do it laparoscopically. Um, but the option that you choose really depends on the length of intestine present, the location of the rectal disease, uh, and whether you can get a site to plug into, uh, the presence of dysplasia, and I guess what I didn't put on this slide, the presence of anal disease and the quality of the anus. So if they have chronic fistulous disease, scarring, phlegmonous change in the, in the sphincter, they may have more challenges with continence afterwards. And then when you do get to the small bowel, we've got the options of resection, whether it's ileocecal or, or small intestine strictureplasty and the different types of anatomical strictureplasty to preserve uh, plus or minus proximal uh, ostomy. Bypass is an option, uh, particularly for some reoperative and recurrent cases with large mesenteric abscesses, um, but it's very rarely necessary. Probably the most important point, and uh, Sang Lee showed a nice um, 
picture by uh, Vic Fazio and one of the ways of managing complex mesentery. The other important thing that uh, Dr. Fazio showed with the randomized control trial was how you pick your resection margin, and this is more important. So obviously with the discussion of close margins or distant margins, uh, this is the picture he developed for the concept of the two centimeter margin, which they proved to be adequate uh, in the randomized control trial, and that's two centimeters from the point of a palpable mesenteric margin in the small bowel. So it's not two centimeters from what looks normal, it's from where that marginal ulceration might be. Uh, and then obviously strictureplasty can be done in a straightforward fashion. We'll normally do a Heineken Michelin strictureplasty. It's the simplest, most straightforward and likely uh, the one associated with the fewest complications. Dealing with specific challenges uh, for these reoperative patients, uh, patients with an abscess, uh, we will try and drain that preoperatively. Uh, you control the sepsis um, and make it a much more manageable uh, situation. Uh, this is a patient who had a, a fistula, an abscess that was drained preoperatively. A uh, fistula was into the bladder and vagina. They actually, interestingly, had a higher BMI for a chronic uh, Crohn's patient, and you can see the abscess was into the abdominal wall. So even though we had a drain in, it didn't completely drain this abscess. Uh, and so you just take it stage by stage. You dissect carefully and slowly. You try and find the planes. If you can't find the plane in the area of the phlegmon or inflammation, you'll go lateral, distal around that, and then come back and leave that core of inflammation in the center uh, that you can take most safely. And then if you take a fistula down that you think is going to leak, you can control it with an endoloop or a suture and pack it outside of your operative plane. Management of fistulous disease in these reoperative patients is fine. This is a patient who had a uh, prior ileocecal resection, obviously done laparoscopically, you can see the absence of any inflammation uh, or adhesions rather here, and now had a jejunal fistula uh, into uh, their ileum uh, going into a psoas abscess. And you just break it down into the component operations, taking down the adhesion here, putting on an endoloop, as I mentioned, to stop contamination when it's out of the field. Uh, this actually communicated with the rectosigmoid as well. And they had, a, a, we did a urethrolysis laparoscopically uh, because they had a small psoas abscess uh, with um, some ureteric obstruction. And the majority, this is old data, but the majority of these fistulas can be dealt with laparoscopically. Similarly, proctocolectomy of colovaginal fistula, a um, patient who had recurrent disease, a prior uh, terminal ileal resection, and now had recurrent colon disease with a fistula. And the nice thing about that, not perhaps for the patient, but at least for the recovery postoperatively, is that you can do it all and take the specimen out through the perineum then and leave them just with their ostomy, just like Philem was talking about. Um, and this patient had a lot, lot of inflammation and a chronic uh, abscess cavity distal to this, which is why you see uh, the drain left in for a couple of days afterwards. So work done by Dr. Kessler and his colleagues looking at some of the causes of conversion and the increased ex ex size of the extraction site. And often we can keep these extraction sites down to three or four centimeters, but obviously it's dependent on the size of the phlegmon. So laparoscopically we'll sometimes stay closer to the bowel to reduce the size of the mesenteric bulk that you're taking out, uh, and that allows you to keep a, a smaller um, smaller extraction site, but you can see how he also found phlegmon size, dilation of the small bowel, and particularly adhesions uh, led to conversion, and then phlegmon size was really the primary driver of the increased extraction site size, and obviously that has potential consequences for hernia rates. What about other challenges to consider? Um, Resecting an anastomosing obstructed small bowel, obviously you have to be particularly carefully, uh, careful technically that you get a high quality anastomosis. Uh, when you're reoperating on these cases, if there's an ileosigmoid fistula, sometimes they can be very occult, so you have to look for it very carefully. And if in any doubt would recommend a little sigmoid sleeve resection around that point, you don't want to leave uh, a small fistula that will cause a postoperative problem, and it's a good time for an intraoperative endoscopy to make sure that the site of your resection and anastomosis have normal looking mucosa. Uh, so as abscess I mentioned briefly, uh, but if in doubt, again, nowadays imaging usually shows you where it is. Try and drain it preoperatively and make sure to fully open it up. And sometimes some of these very chronic ones with a large phlegma are just not suitable uh, for laparoscopic surgery. Um, as is the case sometimes with a larger mesenteric abscess. Uh, bleeding, I think Sang covered this very nicely, uh, and I mentioned uh, the concept of residual anal fistulas, 
um, and how that can change function uh, and also potentially be a problem in these patients who require later proctectomy. So in conclusion, I think laparoscopy has excellent potential uh, for reoperative Crohn's disease patients uh, and works for the majority of patients. Obviously, appropriate training and experience is important, not just in the laparoscopy, but also in managing IBD, uh, particularly for these reoperative patients who are at risk of uh, loss of small bowel, short bowel, other potential complications of surgeries they may have in the future, it really is important to understand the disease process in these patients. And then the challenges, obviously, for recurrent uh, for laparoscopic surgery in these recurrent Crohn's patients are those who've had multiple prior operations of the largest phlegmons, we discussed incision size, uh, and then perhaps some complex uh, internal fistulas prior to surgery. Again, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Thank you very much, Connor, for this very interesting presentation. Are there any questions from the audience? Maybe I ask. A, I want to ask a question. If the patient comes in to clinics and we know he has been operated on for Crohn's disease and shows this large midline, was operated elsewhere, we have all the findings, there's no major fistulas present, which shouldn't we always start, try to do laparoscopy, maybe put the ports in apart from the midline? What is your experience in this? Yeah, I do, Herman, uh, even if they've had a couple of goes. And I still usually put, uh, I try with a sumbopalical port and dissect, because often you get into the abdomen there and it's the easiest site. And only if that doesn't work will I go to an off-midline site. I don't know what you guys do, but that's certainly the way I've approached it. And we'll certainly try, because it's just so frequent that you get a pleasant surprise and the abdomen actually is quite manageable, or you spend a while taking down adhesions and then it's quite manageable. And obviously the recovery is just completely different to mm -hmm. if you did it open. Mm -hmm. Connor, what, what technique do you use to evaluate for strictures? So I just use palpation. Um, one of our colleagues, Ian Lavery, used to use a bull bearing for size. Um, don't do that. Um, just palpation. Palpate them. Yeah, one and if there's a, you always feel that little fibrous ring as you go down. Um, yeah, I, I, I used, I, I've been caught once by someone who'd been on biologics and they had just one of these like a diaphragm kind of uh, across where there had been site of disease activity before. One of my colleagues does use those uh, silver ball oh, bearings. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, I tend to use um, a long jejunostomy tube with a balloon on the end. Uh, okay. It's also called a Baker tube, just so, just so I don't get burned. Sure, sure. No, you certainly can. Uh, well, Dr. Fazio usent, and he got away with it. And I must say, I've just always done the same, just by palpation. So I'll just make sure the bowel is moist. So you can palpate the bowel right up to the DJ flexure. You can pull it out sequentially through a small incision. We'll palpate it, make sure it's moist so you don't rip the serosa, and I'll just slide my fingers along. And if you feel any nodule or anything, uh, then you can always palpate the diameter of the, of the um, stricture with your finger. So palpation is still important? So Certainly for, for me, it's should be done extracorporeally. Extracorporeally, absolutely. Yeah, so you important. need to palpate the entire bowel yes. extracorporeally. Thank, Thank you. you very much.